Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the BRLSI Philosophy Group um, uh, <coughs> to our July meeting. Um, on a technical point, could I ask you please to, to, to mute yourselves and also to turn the camera off because it improves the bandwidth and um, gives us less likelihood of any crashing and so on. Um, <coughs> well, this evening, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Workman, who is going to talk to us about the subject which always fascinates, uh, sex. Um, it's something that uh, in, in normal human life, we, we take so much of, the, of what we observe for granted, and yet it is something which is of philosophical importance. It really does improve our understanding to say, why do we have all these instincts and behaviors? Anyhow, I won't do the talk. I'll hand over to Professor Workman. Thank you very much, Don. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's actually about two years ago, I think Don invited me, but with the pandemic and whatnot, it's, it's taken this long to get going. And as luck would have it, I've got a little bit of a throat thing going on, but I think I'm going to be all right. But I do have my England mug to have a cup of tea to help me along. So I hope the slurping isn't going to be disturbing. Right, and it's, it's a good thing it's tonight, not tomorrow night. That would have been awful, but we may have lost some for the football tonight. So today what I'm going to talk about is male and female reproductive behaviour, insights from evolutionary psychology. And in order to do this, I'm going to start off by posing the question, are men and women actually different psychologically? And the two extreme views on this, because this is, this is something that polarises people. I'll give you a brief bit of personal history. And then the main body of the talk is the nine big sex books. Now, when I say the nine big sex books, I mean, they're people that have written books that are about human reproductive behavior based on Darwin's original ideas and then expanding them and developing them as we go along and then try to reach some conclusions. But before all of that, just so you know what I look like, that, that's a, a picture of me there. I, I was looking quite fit. That was before the pandemic, I should point out. And above that is my email address, lance.workman at southwales.ac.uk. I will put that up at the end in case anybody wants to email me and you think of a question or a query or whatever. Um, since the pandemic struck, I have let myself go a little bit. That's a more recent photo, probably being a bit optimistic, say post-pandemic, but it's, it's a more recent one. As you can see, I've changed my allegiance there on the football front as well. Okay, now, do men and women differ psychologically? There's actually a saying in, in biologists, especially evolutionary biologists, which is that men and women are different. Everybody knows this except social scientists. But social scientists, of course, have a view about this um, that's very much to do with social constructions. And when we get into debates about this, they immediately become ideological. But it isn't an ideological question. It has ideological repercussions, but it's an empirical question. So what you find is immediately there are two extreme views and it's quite polarized. So on the one hand, we have this view that there are large and noticeable differences and that biology creates sex. There is a biological sex, obviously, and that biology guides gender formation. On the other side was the social constructionists and various other people the notion that we're born gender neutral and gender is a social construct. And of course, this is something that's come about very, very recently in terms of coming into prominence. And there is this idea of people being non-binary, which is in the air at the moment. I'll just give you a couple of examples of these two views. Uh, most of you will probably be aware of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, which is John Gray's book. Now, John's Gray's book sold millions and millions and actually made him a rich man. And his basic premise is that men and women are so different, it's as if we come from different planets. And the main difference is we speak different emotional languages. But if you read this book, you can learn to speak the emotional language of the opposite sex, and therefore things will get on a lot better if we can do that. Slightly undermined by the fact that his marriage then uh, broke up, but, but let's not personalise it. But there we are, that's one extreme view. 
The other extreme view is that we are born gender neutral, that it's totally socially constructed, it's, it's brought about by things like the patriarchy and this sort of thing, and if we could get rid of it, things would be a lot better. Uh, this is an extreme view which is associated with people like Judith Butler, who sees no clear-cut differences in internal states and personality between men and women, and where there are differences, it's purely due to society's expectations. But as I say, this is an empirical question. So one way we can resolve this is by looking at personality. Now, personality, according to personality psychologists these days, can be measured along five dimensions. So if you give somebody a personality questionnaire, you give them various questions, you can score them on these dimensions. And these are openness, which is um, how open you are to new ideas, how curious you are. And the other side is closeness, uh, you prefer the same routine, conscientiousness, how dependable and hardworking you are. And the other side, how impulsive, careless, disorganized, extroversion, as we all know, there's extroversion, introversion, because people aren't simply extroverts and introverts, it's a dimension, and you can plot us somewhere on that. Agreeableness, basically how nice you are, how helpful and trusting, or how critical, uncooperative and suspicious. And finally, we've got neuroticism. This is basically an old fashioned term that means problems mainly with anxiety and various forms of depression. And people, are, some people are very calm and their, their mood doesn't change much. They're not prone to mental health problems. On the other end, we have a lot more of that. You may notice the way I've put them up there, they actually spell out the word ocean, which is a mnemonic. You can also get canoe out of it, but I, I quite like um, ocean. So the question is if we're looking at what people's personalities are like. Are men and women different on these, these measures? Okay, now, 10 years ago, a group of American personality psychologists led by Soto, Soto et al, examined personality changes with a cross-cultural sample of over 1 million children, adolescents and adults. So they went from 10 years of age to 65, and I am fully aware that there are people who are younger than 10 and many people who are over 65, but that's what they looked at. So that's what I've got the data for. This was the largest study ever undertaken, this sort of thing. And two things are important here. Firstly, there's well over a million participants. But secondly, it's a cross-cultural study from all around the world. So if they see any differences, they can be quite confident as to whether or not these are significant. So they measured them on these five. Now, Interestingly, what they were interested in was, do we change between the age of 10 and 65? And prior to this study being published, I would have said from 20 on, personality is reasonably stable. We don't tend to change that much, but they found that we do. They weren't really concerned with sex or gender, but they did uncover evidence of gender differences, which actually surprised them. So. In 2018, myself and my partner, Sandra Taylor, published a book on social development, and we extracted these data and we produced five different graphs to look at how this changes and how it varies between males and females. And um, I can actually say, I think these are really superb graphs. I could say that because Sandy did them, not me, but I did help to extract the data. So what we've got here clearly is along the bottom, we've got age and then the mean score. So the higher you are, the more you are on this particular Right, And we can see that at the age of 10, females, the sort of blue turquoise line, and males aren't very different. Females are a little bit more conscientious. That's the first of these I'm showing here uh, than males. There's a dip at 15, middle of adolescence, where they both become less conscientious, and then it rises. But what is it? Two things are interesting about this. From the age of 20 on, women are more conscientious than men. And although the difference is small, it is statistically significant. So women are more conscientious than men. The second thing is, and you find this with a, a number of, of these things, is that people as they get older, get more conscientious. So if you want somebody to do a good job, get a woman who's at least 65, and the odds are she'll do a good job and she'll fulfill it, much more so than a, a, a lad of 15, for example. We look at agreeableness, we have a broadly similar pattern, with, but except that even by the age of 10, girls are more agreeable than boys. There is this dip at the age of 15, it rises at 20, and then for men it kind of dips and goes up a little bit, it doesn't really change much. Women continue 
by and large, to become more agreeable as they get older. And that difference, again, is uh, statistically significant. If we look at neuroticism, we get the reverse pattern in as much as women have more of a problem with neuroticism than men. Now at 10, kids don't really report differences in anxiety and depression in terms of the, the genders. But immediately by the time we reach 15 and it continues on to 20, really, the, the genders, the sexes are really quite different. And women, interestingly, have much uh, greater problems with depression and anxiety than men from really from about the age of 15 for the rest of their lives. But the good news is, as we get older, we both um, improve on this, and especially women. And in fact, one of the, the repeated findings is that women have problems with depression and anxiety, particularly during their reproductive years. And then these problems tend to lessen unless they've got serious mental health issues. And there's all sorts of debates as to why that is the case. Extroversion, we find at 10, kids are actually very extroverted at 10. They're virtually exhibitionists. Of course, there's a lot of individual differences there. But this comes down. And interestingly, from about the age of 15 on, girls are more extroverts than boys, which, which surprised me. I didn't expect that. And again, this is the case cross-culturally, and it is statistically significant. Finally, openness. Um, there's an interesting pattern here. They start off broadly similar, openness comes down at 15, continues to come down for women, and from there onwards, men are more open to new ideas than women, which again, surprised me. So there's a few things we can say about this. The first thing we can say is that overall, people get nicer and more stable as they get older. And that's the good news. We don't know how much it continues beyond 65, but certainly at 65, people are generally happier they're more agreeable, they're more conscientious, they're basically nicer people, which is quite nice to know. But we're interested in sex. And what I would say is if you look at three of these traits, they actually fulfill our gender stereotypes. Some stereotypes are true, some are not true, and some are completely the reverse. So females, as you would think, are more agreeable and they're more conscientious, but they also suffer from anxiety and depression. And if you if you look at a bus or a train, you have to sit next to somebody. Both men and women prefer to sit next to women and men, probably because they're a little bit more agreeable and conscientious. But interestingly, we have these other things here that um, females are more extrovert than males and also that males score higher on openness. So we are a bit different. The differences aren't huge, but they are statistically significant, as I keep saying. And this, this raises the question. Where do these differences come from and how do they feed into uh, reproductive and sexual behavior, if you like? So I'm gonna come on to that. I just want a little bit of digression first. Now, this is a bit of self-indulgent personal history, if you like. 29 years ago, in August, 1992, I used to buy um, a newspaper called The Guardian. They, they used to sell things called newspapers, as you might remember. They were called that because they were made of paper and they had the newspapers on them and people used to buy them in the millions. Um, now, at the time in 1992, I was running the first undergraduate module in evolutionary psychology in the UK. I was trying to bring it in and, and get people interested in it. And what one of the sections I used to read was called Guardian Notes and Queries. So some of you will be familiar with this. And what happened was people would write in questions and then a week later, people would have sent their answers to these questions. And you literally had to write these things and put them in the post. And then a week later, they'd choose the ones they thought were most interesting. So somebody asked, why are women generally smaller than men? And I thought, well, that's obvious. It's, it's Darwinian sexual selection, which I'm going to talk a lot about today. And I explained how that works. And I will come back to that. But the reason I'm putting this up is because what really shocked me was all hell broke loose. Um, feminists didn't like it, that I was suggesting we've evolved to be different. That was a bad thing. But the media in general loved it because it had sex in the title. And some of the media seemed to think that I'd invented or discovered this new process called sexual selection. All of the daily national newspapers interviewed me on this and I had radio stations. Of course, three or four days later, it was completely forgotten. But what, the reason I'm raising this is it suddenly occurred to me, I was bringing in a lot of sexual selection into my evolution psychology module. And I thought people had generally heard of this. And I discovered, I was being a bit conceited in thinking this. 
and in actual fact, only a small number of people have heard of it and think it's important. So that, that's what I want to say, and it is now better known, but most people, although they've heard of natural selection, they still haven't heard of sexual selection. Oh, and, and I ended up in various newspapers, and, and embarrassingly, there was one newspaper used to um, phone me up and interview me when anything sexy or romantic came up, and they then labelled me top Welsh love doctor, which is a bit of an ambiguous thing, but it was because I was talking about uh, evolutionary psychology and romantic behaviour and that, that sort of thing anyway, so we'll, we'll pass on it. Now, the main body of the rest of the talk is going to be these nine books, which have all attempted to look at human sexual reproductive behaviour. And I've put them in broadly chronological order, beginning with Darwin and ending with Fred Toad's book that came out about six or seven years ago. I'll say from the outset that some of these people, some of these authors, I know slightly. Two of them are actually close personal friends, but I don't think it'll affect the way I'm going to assess their books. Although, as it happens, I do think that they, they are pretty good those books. I won't run through them now. I'll, I'll, I'll go through them one at a time. So why these books in particular? I think there's, there's two reasons for this. Firstly, they examine the current state of play, or as it was when the book came out. And they make an original contributing contribution to our understanding of the relationship between human sexuality and evolution. Some of them, I think, got it wrong, but they raise important questions. So they make people think and they made me think. The second reason is all of these books, I think, can be considered as crossover texts. That is, they're not just for students and lecturers. They're for the general public. All of them sold to the general public and they're written in a way that's accessible, which I think is good because we need to get these concepts out there. They're all there along the bottom, going from Darwin all the way through to Fred Totes. So I'm going to go through these ones at a time and show you what I think they contributed. So let's start with Darwin. Now, this is called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, published in 1871. Now, after, after 1859, when Darwin published The Origin of Species, by 1871, 12 years later, he was ready to come back in and publish another book on evolution. It's his first book on evolution since The Origin of Species. And it's a much more confident book than The Origin of Species. The Origin of Species is, is almost apologetic. You know, I have these ideas that you might like to consider. This one's much more confident. And the reason it's more confident is because Darwin's reputation had grown. By 1871, Darwin was the most famous scientist on the planet and his works were read throughout the world pretty much. But also he had evidence on his side. The Origin of Species was criticised by a lot of people, as you know. And one of the reasons was that his gradualistic natural selection with one species and one group of animals leading to another group of animals didn't seem to have any intermediate forms. There should be something, people actually said, between a lizard and a bird. There should be these intermediate forms. But they started to appear in the fossil record. Now people knew what to look for. And in 1863, the first intermediate form, Archaeopteryx, which is perfectly between birds and reptiles, was uncovered. Also, uh, people began to uncover Neanderthal fossils, which showed a more primitive type of human relative. Just so we're clear, this is a picture of Archaeopteryx. That's the original fossil. There's a lot of them being found now and, and similar relatives of Archaeopteryx. So you can see it's got reptilian teeth. Uh, birds don't have teeth, of course. It's got claws on the ends of the wing. It's got what's called a post-anal tail. It's got vertebrae beyond the anus going into the tail. But at the same time, it's got perfect aerofoil wings. I don't think it would have been brilliant at flying, but it could have climbed up trees, flapped a bit and, and glided to another tree or down to the ground quite well. So the descent of man really fleshed out the concept of sexual selection. So, so what is sexual selection? Well, if natural selection is about surviving and developing traits to survive, sexual selection is purely about gaining access to mates, gaining access to the opposite sex. So there's two components to sexual selection. There's competing with your own sex for the attention of the other sex. And then there's attracting the other sex. And Darwin said, the things that this lead to are choosy females, competitive males, and attractive sexy males. He didn't actually know why it was that way around, 
but he said that's how it works that's how sexual selection works and it we have to treat it differently to natural selection because it it pulls in a different direction to natural selection often natural selection helps you to avoid predators sexual selection makes you bright colored it makes peacocks incredibly sexy the, the, the cocks anyway the males but Peacocks are killed far more than peahens because tigers and foxes and things can see them a mile up. So you can see that these two forces can be pulling against each other. One of the sad things about the concept of sexual selection was the way it was, it was accepted or not accepted. And in particular, psychologists completely ignored it for a century. Oh, it's nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us at all. Sociologists ignored it. A lot of people ignored it. Even a lot of what became evolutionary biologists weren't really that interested. There were one or two beavering away, but, but on the whole, it wasn't used. And it's a real shame because the concept of sexual selection allows us to test a number of hypotheses. And it's only really in the last 30 years, and especially in this century, that people have really began to test hypotheses derived from sexual selection theory. So in a nutshell, Workman and Reader, me and my co-author, Think of it as if natural selection is survival of the fittest, sexual selection is survival of the sexiest. But the question is, does it lead to sexy males? Well, generally in the animal kingdom, females are a bit drab, sorry about this, males are sexy. But something has gone wrong with humans. Human males aren't sexy. And, and I'm illustrating this with uh, two random human people. One of them's Lance and one of them's Kylie. And Females, you can see clearly from this slide, are much sexier than males. Sorry about that. It's, it's not about me personally or about Kylie, but females are a bit sexy. Males really aren't. I think I know, I now know why that's the case, but it's something I struggled with for a long time. That said, I do think you'll agree they do make a lovely pair, or at least, at least in my eyes, they do anyway. Okay. So nothing really happened for almost a hundred years. As I say, there's some specialist evolutionary biologists worked on human sex from an evolutionary perspective, but by and large, not a great deal happened. Now in 1967, Desmond Morris published The Naked Ape. And again, I'm sure possibly all of you will have heard of The Naked Ape. Some of you may have read it. Um, possibly all of you will know. And what Desmond Morris did was to bring in our modern knowledge of ape reproductive and aggressive behavior and look at humans as if we are an ape, which, which in a sense we are, of course, but of course a naked ape, as you can see from the cover there. Now in Mos Morris's model of human reproductive behavior, men are very much the dominant individual and women are very much subordinate and secondary in evolution. And Morris, one of the arguments he made was that because men are regularly away hunting for lengthy periods, their women had to evolve a pair bond tendency in order to ensure that the men weren't cuckolded. So the human pair bond came from the fact that women evolved this pair bond tendency to please men so they wouldn't be cuckolded. Now, I'm loath to put up the next slide, but I'm gonna to have to because it's like teaching my grandmother to suck eggs. Desmond Morris writes beautifully. His descriptions of animal behavior are fantastic and he writes page turner books and, and he's extremely experienced. But I think even in 1967, there were some errors in his ideas. And certainly I think since then, uh, these have become more apparent. So I think there are four problems with the naked day. The first one is he presents a very male-centered view of evolution. So females evolve features to keep males happy and are very much supportive. Now, I don't have a problem with this because it's politically incorrect. Well, I suppose I do, but that's not my point. My point is I think it's empirically incorrect, which is, which is more important. We need to get to the truth of these things. The second point is similar as well. It's very much Western um, Eurocentric, if you like. And even by 1967 and, and, and well before then, social scientists were looking at cultural relativism and cultural variability. Again, my argument is not on politically correct grounds, or you could make that argument, but that's not what I'm looking at. I think it's actually factually wrong to, to center only on those things. The third problem is he talks very much about the good of the species. So we develop features for the good of the species. Natural selection seems to 
work on the group or the species. Whereas actually, even by 1967, ethologists were shifting away from the good of the species and the group towards the individual or even the individual's genes. And of course, that culminated in 1976 in Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene. So it's already shifted that way. And the fourth problem is that his, his work on evolution has a teleological element to it. So evolution kind of looks ahead and put things into place so that it works out. So the females became faithful so that it would work out for their men folk sort of thing. But of course, natural selection has to work on what's there at the time and on our, our immediate ancestors. So I'm sorry about all of that. But having said that, and I'm sorry about this, this flashing image, you'll see why in a minute. The naked ape is still pretty influential. Only a few years ago in 2017 in the Eurovision Song Contest, the Italian entry, Francesco Gabbani, had a song about the naked ape. Uh, the naked ape is dancing. And he actually appeared in Ukraine, as it happens, at uh, the Eurovision Song Contest, singing his song with a trained gorilla next to him, dancing next to him. I, I, I know how on earth they trained this gorilla, but it's, it's pretty clever. I'll show you a brief clip. I won't show it for too long because it does wear off a bit, but you'll be pleased to know I haven't recorded the sound just the image so you can see what was going on here. There's Francesco and there's the trained gorilla, highly trained to, to do these dance moves, as, as you can see. I mean, I can't see how the UK could possibly compete with that, that sort of level of, of production there. Um, one more time, there we go. There's the gorilla, there's Francesco. Well, I, I think that's probably enough. If you're wondering, by the way, before I move on to my next book, it came sixth and our entry came 15th. We can only dream of reaching the dizzy heights of 15th now, of course. Okay, if we move on about 10 or 12 years, we come to Donald Simmons' book, The Evolution of Human Sexuality. Now, this is a much more modern book. This is Don Simmons' work with Richard Dawkins was influenced by him, and I think he influenced Richard Dawkins. So he had a much more nuanced, modern understanding of the relationship between evolution and behaviour. And he brought in a new component, so he looked at Darwin's ideas on sexual selection, but he also brought in Robert Trivers' concept of parental investment theory. Now, in 1971, Robert Trivers said that there's asymmetry in parental investment pretty much throughout the animal kingdom. Females are obligate high investors. Males aren't necessarily. Think about it, birds. Birds, the females have an egg. The male in songbirds does actually help out quite a lot, but he doesn't have to produce these very costly eggs. Mammals even more so. Females gestate the young inside them and it takes a lot of their nutrients and whatnot, and then they have to give birth and then they have to suckle it and all these sort of things. And in fact, in 99% of mammals, the males don't do any parental care at all. The males are in effect sperm donors and they're off over the horizon looking for another female. Fortunately, human males, or, or most human males, aren't like that. One or two perhaps are, but mostly we're not. We're, we're quite high in male parental investment, not as high as females, because we're not obligate investors. Now, you can bring this into the concept of sexual selection and help to explain why we have different mating strategies. So if you're a female and you invest a lot, then you're a resource for males, but also if you get it wrong, then the cost is very high to you to get it wrong. If males get it wrong, the cost can be very low because they're not obligate investors. Having said that, in the case of humans, I think males, the more they invest, the more they are going to like to survive. So we have to weigh all this up, of course. So really, what Don Simmons did was to build this into Darwin's ideas and also think about the challenges of what's become known as the EEA the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. Now, this isn't just a time, it's a combination of the time, place and ecological pressures faced by our species during our evolution. In terms of time, it's probably from about 11 to 12,000 years ago up until about maybe 2 million years ago when we evolved. So looking at those features, looking at the fact that females invest a lot more, and that's why they're choosing, which Darwin never quite solved. But he also added in the fact that Females have a limited period of fertility compared to males. So they start to lose fertility at a certain age. They may shift to a grandmother strategy rather than a mother strategy. 
males can continue to reproduce if they can convince somebody to allow them to recombine their genes with them. So females are choosy, they're looking for commitment. Males show their good by reach producing signals of status. This is what Don Sim said. So he then goes on to examine the costs and benefits of each sex in remaining faithful and suggests that ancestral women, it would have paid them to actually have a, a mixed strategy. So they may have left more surviving offspring by sometimes mating with the male that is of higher status than the current one. Cross-cultural evidence suggests that when women are um, playing away from home, when there is infidelity, it most likely occurs during ovulation, which fits in very much with Don Simmons' model. This doesn't mean, of course, that women are hardwired to do this. It just helps us knowing about EEA, parental investment theory, sexual selection theory, knowing about all these things, it helps us to predict when this is likely to happen. And if it sounds like I'm, I'm sort of besmirching women, of course, it takes two to tango, it takes two to recombine your genes, and therefore it, it it taints men as much as it taints women. I like this quote here at the bottom here. Everywhere sex is understood to be something females have that males want. This does happen cross-culturally. Now, he made a number of predictions. and I'm, I'm just going to give you one here. He said that women's mate preferences should vary throughout the menstrual cycle in ways compatible with a mixed mating strategy. And there is actual empirical support for this. Bellis and Baker found that women for most of their side, prefer uh, males that look like they're going to invest, dad-type characters, and then they shift towards a more masculine genetic quality of males who are more cads, if you like. And you can actually test this, for example, by asking women at different points in their menstrual cycle. It's not easy to do, but it can be done. And you produce different pictures, and you can manipulate the same face so it's more gracile or robust. And when they're fertile, they tend to shift towards the robust look and that correlates with status in males due to things like sporting prowess and whatnot. So they may shift from dads to cads at a certain point in their cycle. Those women that do this most probably don't, but, but we, we don't know, do we? Now, the other thing he talked about was the fact that men prefer younger women because of their limited period of fertility, and women prefer older males because they're likely to have more status and wealth. And a whole heap of studies have tended to support this. This is one from Kendrick and Keith back in 1992. So if you look at the upper graph, if you look at the, the blue graph there, it's a male's age along the bottom, 20 to 60, for example. And the zero there is the male's age. And what do they prefer, older or younger? And at the age of 20, men are quite happy with a woman between 20 and 25 and 20 and 15, which is actually a little bit dodgy when you think about it. But anyway. Um, as you move along this and men get older, the age range they prefer gets younger and younger and younger. They're trying to dip down into the fertile years or signals of fertility. But if you look at the red one below, if you look at a woman's age beginning at 20, they already want a man who's older than them. He's more likely to have wealth and status and throughout their range, they'll, they're prepared to accept um, a younger man, but most of it, they really want an older man. Also, um, in these Lonely Hearts advertisements, um, women emphasise their beauty. Beauty correlates with fertility and youthfulness, and men don't emphasise that. They tend to emphasise their wealth. They also emphasise height, interestingly, because women generally prefer a taller man, but it takes all time. Okay, my next book is by Jerome Barco, Jerry Barco. And it's called Darwin, Sex and Status. I'll, I'll show my hand immediately. Jerry is, is a, a personal friend of, of mine. Um, but when his book came out and I read it, I didn't know him then, of course. So, so I don't think I'm coloured by that. Um, Jerry is a polymath. He brings everything to bear on things. So in this book, he brings anthropology, biology, psychology, animal behaviour, sociology. Um, all, all of these things he, he brings in. in. In fact, he's such a polymath now. He's been interested in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and he's part of the board on METI, which is messaging extraterrestrial um, intelligence. And he's their evolution expert trying to predict if there is life out there, what it might have evolved to be. It's absolutely fascinating man. So Barco argues we need to bring in all these multiple angles. You know, Darwin's very important. It's, it's, it's the first word in the title of his book. But to fully understand it, we need to bring in all these other ideas and 
develop a synthesis of these approaches. But he, he also feels we need to go back to Darwin and to sexual selection in particular, also natural selection, but particularly sexual selection to understand um, our reproductive practices and our reproductive practices are part and parcel of cultural transmission as well into the culture. These are his other books, by the way, there's The Adapted Mind, 1992, also with Cosmides and Tooby, very important book, 1992, the first book that had the words evolutionary psychology in the title, and then Missing the Revolution, Darwinism for Social Sciences, 2006, and then last year he co-edited a book with me and we'll read it, Evolution Perspectives on Human Behaviour, which I'll probably come back to at the end. Now, this is one of the first books to consider something which we call the mismatch hypothesis. And that's the idea that there's a mismatch between the environment that we've created today and the sort of environment of the EEA. So a lot of things that were good in the EEA, which we still have in our, in our evolution, if you like, or we still have within human nature, can be problematic today. An example he gives is that on the savannah, men will strive for status to increase the market value, their market value to women. That's fine. You find this in tribal societies, if the man's muscular, if he's good at throwing a spear, if he's good at talking and explaining things, if he's good with people, his status goes up. But on the savannah in tri tribal society where we evolve, you can only get so much power. You might be head of a tribe of 100 people. You might get a bit more meat than somebody else for your family, these sorts of things. But you don't really own land. There's not much you can actually um, have. You, you can only have a limited amount of power. Jerry says, actually, today there are big problems because of the amount of power men can attain. And remember, men go for power and status in the evolutionary model because it gives them access to women. So some of the wars and the problems we have today are because they were successful in the EEA for men to, to demonstrate the power they have. But today they can become extremely powerful with nation states and prophetically, Barco warns that men who seek status at all costs, this can lead a nation state down the path to brinkmanship and even warfare. And there are three characters there who, who are dubious in this sense, I, I think you'll agree. And, and interestingly, all three of them are known to be philanderers. I'm, I hope I'm not um, saying something inappropriate. No, I don't think I am, actually. Now, the next book was actually written by a woman. This is Helen Crone in 1991, The Ant and the Peacock. Um, now, Helena Cronin, actually, this is her PhD thesis, tweaked a bit. So she submitted her PhD thesis to the external examiner, John Maynard Smith, in the late 80s at Sussex. John Maynard Smith, I was at Sussex, he was one of my mentors. And he read it and he said, this is great, you know, we'll have a Bible, but it's fantastic. But really, you need to tweak it a bit and turn it into a book. Um, and he actually wrote the, the, the forward for it. It's beautifully written. And it really looks at two things. Firstly, there's the, the reason individuals engage in altruistic behavior. I'm not going to talk much about that today. But the second bit of the book is why are male animals sexy and why are females not? Hence the peacock, the male sexy. But also she, she demonstrates very much the concept of female choice, this thing that Darwin came up with that other people poo pooed, and, and points out that it's been ignored or, or abandoned for almost a century. And yet female choice can be such a powerful force in the evolution of male reproductive behavior, males and females. Sadly, one of the problems with it when, when Darwin wrote The Descent of Man was that Wallace completely poo-pooed it and people followed Wallace rather than Darwin and continued to do so for many years. They thought, well, males are bigger and stronger and they don't have much, females don't have much choice. But it's very, very clear if you look at the animal kingdom and you look at humans that yes, females have a lot of choice and their choices can affect males. And she suggests that really male sexiness in the animal kingdom has to be based on animal, honest signals for sexual selection to work. And in humans, it's about status and wealth and these sort of things, but they have to be honest signals because females will probe and it paid their ancestors to probe. She also prophetically suggests that female choice will come to be seen as a very strong selective force in controlling the evolution of male sexual desire. And it's to her credit that today it is. And in fact, so much so that today, some evolutionary biologists believe female choice can be a driver of speciation. It can actually lead one species to form two different species because of the choices that females make. So 
an extremely important book, 1999. I think she should update it now, but she hasn't gone back to it since then. That's 30 years old now. I have met her, by the way, at a dinner with her once. She's a fascinating lady. Jeffrey Miller, coming up to 2000 now, he wrote The Mating Mind, How Sexual Choice Shaped the Evolution of Human Nature. So in, 19, uh, in, sorry, in 2000, Miller began to champion the idea that once we had biparental care, once males started investing more in offspring, the driving force for increased brain size and intelligence, and in particular, importantly, language, became sexual selection rather than natural selection. So natural selection created the large primate brain on the open savanna, about the size of a, um, a tangerine or, or a small grape, grape, <laughs> a small um, orange. But in less than two million years, it's gone from the size of a large tangerine to the size of a grape. And he thinks this has happened because males and females were choosing partners who were intelligent and who showed um, a, a high level of emotional maturity, if you like. And in particular, females would choose a male that was going to hang around and be clever enough to bring home the bacon. Now, the interesting thing about sexual selection now, now is that it can make things happen much, much faster than natural selection. Natural selection takes forever. Sexual selection can happen much, much faster. And that's how he explains the rise in intelligence of the so-called naked ape so rapidly. Now, one of the things he talks about is language in particular. And what's interesting is that humans, an educated human, typically has a word family of about 20,000 words. But we only need 6,000. Literally, you can say the same things in terms of getting information over with 6,000 words. But more than two thirds of the words we use are in effect redundant. And he explains this by saying we use vocabulary, especially males, but both sexes use vocabulary to demonstrate intelligence, to demonstrate how worthy people are and how clever they are. Um, and we do this all the time without necessarily being aware of it. I'm probably doing it a bit now, if I'm honest. And this, when you start to pick apart language, you can see how much redundancy there is and how people use language to sound clever and worthy. I'll, I'll give you two or three of my bugbears. You've probably got your own. OK, the first one is resonates and resonances. You know, people look at the painting, well, that resonates with me. What they really mean is I like that painting. Um, this book has resonances to today. You know, oh, next time somebody says that, say to them, what do you actually mean? What does that mean? And usually what it means is, well, I like it. You know. Um, another one to sound worthy and, 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 and dynamic is going forward. Don't, don't you hate it at meetings and politicians putting going forward on the end of sentences? So blah, 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 going forward, or sometimes going forward, blah, 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 blah. Well, in my universe, time only goes forward. So there isn't an option. We have to go forward. Don't say it. Um, my final one, because I'm getting on a bit of a soapbox and I realise it, is, is um, people don't like things anymore. They feel passionately about it. It's far more worthy and convincing. And the, the meetings I've been to work with say, I feel passionate about the student experience. We need to empower students. Students can, must, are so empowered at meetings all the time now. They must come out all powerful and with huge debt. Anyway. I'll, I'll stop going on about it. But we do use a lot more. So rather than developing a sexy body, which human males don't have, things like large antlers and coloured feathers, we don't have that. We're pretty dull. We're not a very sexy species. I disagree with Desmond Morris and thinks we are, um, especially males. We develop a sexy brain. But then you have to ask, well, well, why? You know, why do females have such language abilities? And, and Miller's answer is, well, they have to have equal abilities in order to probe and even possibly more so because they have to probe to be able to test them because, as Helena Cronin said, these have to be honest signals of male quality. One thing I would like to point out, because it's quite interesting, he says the sexy brain extends beyond face-to-face -face flirtation and talking and pressing the female with your wit and your knowledge and this sort of thing, and that men do things like make great works of art and they published books, for example. And in 2000, he surveyed things and found men had actually published 10 times as many books as women. And he claims this is to, to impress women. I think there may be other things going on. You know, I, I think you can argue about how sexist society is now, but historically, I think it was probably easier for men to publish them. But anyway, I'm just putting this up because he points out that if a man publishes books, then it leads to a rise in their sexual charisma. 
And if you publish three or four editions of a book, then you must have huge sexual charisma. So there we go. <coughs> if you believe that, you believe anything. So sexual selection drove human language and intelligence because it's considered desirable by both sexes, but it's particularly important if men want to show status and impress women. So we have a sexy brain, not a sexy body. Moving on, it's difficult to know where to put this book by David Buss because there are three different editions from the 1990s, the early noughties, and then uh, another edition a few years ago. The first edition is very much based on a large cross-cultural study of what men and women desire in a long-term romantic partner. And he found some patterns. He found some cross-cultural differences, but he found some commonalities. And he basically got a book out of the first one. Since then, he's done a huge amount of research. and He's updated this book. But this is his sort of stance. He says evolutionary psychology provides a meta theory for predicting when and where to expect gender differences and when and where to expect gender similarities. He points out that for the most part, we're very, very similar. We're not from Mars and Venus. We're actually very similar. It, it's when it comes to reproductive strategies, sexual behavior, desire, these sort of things that we differ. I would point out um, I have met David Buss. I don't know him particularly well, but he's a, he seems an extremely nice man. But during the three editions of his book, you can see that what normally happens is he's aged a bit. So that, that's what happens in life. Although I've been fortunate in the three editions of my book, I haven't aged at all. As you can see from the pictures on the left, I look exactly the same as I did when the first edition came out. So that's, that's quite nice to know anyway. Little aside there. So I'm just going to look at some of Buss's work here. Now, because they had identical recurrent adaptive challenges to use his language, habitat selection, avoidance process, aid kin, gain resources, avoid parasites, all these things, the same for men and women, mostly were very similar. But there were differences concerned with mating and sexual behaviour, so so. And he's done a lot of studies that suggest there are differences. And one of these is jealousy, sexual jealousy. How do we differ? Well, he studied this in a number of ways. One of them is looking at how upset men and women are by two different scenarios. Having a passion, having passionate sex with another, this is your partner having passionate sex with another, or your partner forming an emotional attachment to another. So this is your partner falling in love with somebody else. And the top slide is men. Now men tend to find very strongly that the idea of their partner having passionate sex with another, that's the main thing that upsets them the most. Women, it's the other way around. It's forming an emotional attachment. And he's, and he's looked at this in various ways. He's wired people out. Um, he's taken blood samples and all sorts of things. And it, it keeps coming out this way. Note that neither sex is impressed with either of these things. They don't like it, but there's a big difference here. How does he explain this? Well, what he says is we have to come back to the fact that only men can be cuckolded. So if your partner has a baby, uh, then she knows it's hers. She, she shares her genes with it, it's hers. You don't know 100% that it's yours. And until very recently, I had these sort of tests, but certainly not in our evolutionary past. So the main thing that men fear is putting resources, investing in offspring that isn't your offspring, doesn't share your genes by common descent. Women, on the other hand, um, don't want the resources going elsewhere. They don't want their partner to fall in love with another woman and leave and, and take their resources with them. So th these are the roots of these differences in sexual jealousy. Neither sex likes either of these things, but one is worse than the other. And if you look at the bottom one, this idea of your partner having passionate sex with another woman, no, they don't like it. They don't like it at all. But cross-culturally, if a man gets caught playing away from home, and if you assume he wants to save his marriage or partnership, he will invariably say these words. It meant nothing to me. It was only sex. You know, it's like eating a hamburger or something, or scratching an itch. Uh, and that doesn't mean she's going to be dead sure. But what he's reassuring her is that he hasn't fallen in love with someone else. He's not going to do so. Now, Buss over the years, and he's, he's got a whole team looking at this, uh, have looked at Darwin's and Simmons' ideas and tested a lot of things that Simmons actually came up with in his book. I'm not going to go through all this list, but here are some of the things that have come up time and time again. I'll just point some of them out. Um, men are more likely to seek uh, than women to seek short term relationships. That's not a big surprise, is it? Uh, men like to have more sexual partners over a lifetime. It's probably not a big surprise either. Men are more likely than women to consent to sex with a stranger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, women prefer cues related to a man's ability and willingness to devote resources. Um, 
what is interesting is men relax their mate preferences when it's a short-term mating context, whereas women increase their selectivity. So women, if they're going to have an affair, they'll go for a higher status male, better quality male, if, if I can say that. Men will come down a step if they're having an affair. In fact, basically, they just want to pulse. All right, so there you go. <laughs> I won't read them all out. If you want the slides, I can actually send them to you, by the way. Oh, here's, here's just one of his, his things about consenting sex with an anonymous stranger. This Again, this occurs cross-culturally. Um, and there are quite big cultural differences, I would point out, but not in the pattern, but whether or not an individual would, would uh, consent to having sex with an anonymous stranger. In some cultures, it's completely taboo for women to have sex before marriage anyway, and even some countries where it's considered naughty for men to, but, but there we go. So you see there's a very, very different pattern, certainly would certainly would not, they kind of mirror each other. Although men aren't completely Neanderthals, if you look at this, they probably wouldn't, certainly would, it's still only about 50%. The other thing I've got on this slide is that one thing that Buss has done a lot of in, in this century is he's looked beyond the usual sort of samples that psychologists look at. These are called weird samples. And if you haven't come across weird, weird is Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic samples basically the West and well-educated. It's largely students, to be honest. So he's, he's done a lot of cross-cultural studies. And in fact, psychology in general has been criticised for mainly most of its studies has involved weird samples. And evolutionary psychology actually is ahead of the game when it comes to um, going beyond weird samples at the moment. But we could do a lot more, actually. OK, this is my, my next book, and this is by Christopher Ryan. Casilda Jeffer. This one's a bit different to the others. This came out in 2010 and it's called Sex at Dawn, the Prehistoric Origins of Modern Sexuality. Now they actually have, are quite critical of a lot of evolutionary psychology and they say that evolutionary psychologists are very much tied to the notion of enduring pair bonds. Um, I don't know that we're all tied to that and um, I think they may be overstating it but by and large we do believe there is a stable pair bond that happens cross-culturally. And they suggest that actually we're not naturally a pair bonded species and that we're more like bonobos than chimpanzees. Bonobos, I don't know if you know about them, but they are hypersexual. It's like shaking hands. When they meet, they often just have sex. It only lasts a few seconds and then it's over, but they do it all the time. Um, and they claim that that was the human natural state is to have sex all over the place. And this is just suppressed by modern societal structures, which insist on these pair bonds being formed. And that we could do this, and it wouldn't lead to problems of jealousy. And it actually helps to strengthen bonds within the group. This book sold a lot of copies, as you can realize, there's a lot of sex in there. Just as an aside, before I say a bit more about it, I was actually reading this book as part of my research, as I do. And I left it in a hotel room, and I went home, and I realized I'd left it there. So I phoned the hotel and said, I think I've left a book in my room. I said, what's it called? Um, it's called Sex at Dawn, but it's not that sort of a book, it's a science book, I guess. I'm just thought I'd share that with you. Now, I, I mentioned bonobos and chimpanzees there, which, which a lot of evolution psychologists are interested in, um, because especially our close relatives. Now, if we look at this map of Africa, we see north of the Great Congo River, outlined in red, that's where the, the common chimpanzees live. Pan troglodytes, and also you can see there's an area up to West Africa where they live. They used to be much more widespread, their numbers are declining quite, quite rapidly, sadly. Now, below the Great Bend of the Congo, which is a huge, huge river, you, you probably realize this very wide, are the bonobos. And the idea is that about two million years ago, when the Congo formed, uh, chimpanzees split into two species because they were on either side of different ecological pressures and it led to two different species of chimpanzees. Now what um, they claim is that there are similarities in sexual behavior between humans and bonobos which are very different to chimpanzees and there's a whole list of them that they come back to. Firstly they say both species copulate throughout the menstrual cycle, that is true. Both enjoy many different copulatory positions, in particular ventral ventral positions, chips, chimp stick, as they put it, much to very much to rear entry. Um, chimps, incidentally, don't generally, the males aren't interested in the females unless they're in estrus of the menstrual cycle. So they're very much like other mammals, but bonobos are like humans, they can have sex at any point. 
They often gaze into each other's eyes when copulating, and the vulva is located to the front of the body in bonobos like humans, and this makes ventral ventral sex much more likely. Also, a couple of interesting points. Food sharing is very much associated with sex in humans and bonobos, less common in chips. And homosexual behavior is relatively common in both bonobos and humans, very rare in chimps. In fact, homosexual behavior is, is more common in bonobos than in humans. You can see a picture of them down there. I'll just enlarge that with the next slide so we get a picture of what they're actually like. So the chimps are on the right here, there's a male and female, and the bonobos are on the left. They are separate species. We've got Pantroglodytes and Panpaniscus. The common chimps, pan troglodytes, are more robust. They've got more of a snout, and the males in particular are more robust. The um, bonobos are a bit more gracile. They're actually better at walking bipedally as well. So you more often see them carrying something and walking bipedally. Not as good as humans, but they're they're pretty pretty good at it. They're less aggressive as well, but they're fully capable of aggression. Believe me. Um, but I'd rather be in a troop of bonobos than a troop of chimpanzees because they can be unpredictably uh, aggressive. There we go. So, sex at dawn does make us question to what extent we are a monogamous species, because they don't believe, as I say, that there's an enduring human pair bond that is natural to us. Well, I have some problems with some of their arguments, I have to say. Um, they, they really think about what's in it for the group. And this has become known as naive group selections in these days. So they focus what's in it for the group rather than for the individual and their genes. So it's very much like Des and Morris in that case. It's not very selfish gene work. But also what I really object to is their version of Darwin's ideas on sexual selection theory. It's cherry picked and it's misleading. Here's a quote from their book. Darwin saw sexual selection as a struggle between males for sexual access to passive fertile females who would submit to the victor. That's completely wrong. That's entirely wrong. Darwin consistently in The Descent of Man emphasizes female choice and that females are very much involved in this thing. There's one other thing I would add into the mix and that is they don't believe in enduring human pair bonds, but they are an enduring human pair bond themselves. The two authors have been in a long-term relationship for a long time. As far as I know, they still are. So it kind of falsifies their argument a little bit perhaps or, or maybe again I shouldn't actually personalize it. Now one of the points they make is this this point of similarity in sexual behavior between bonobos and humans and this is very interesting and I think they make a good point but I think they get their evolution wrong. The problem is if you look at the graph on the right at the bottom bonobos and common chimps divided into two species about two million years ago. But the common ancestor of chimps and humans was more like seven million years ago. So basically, we didn't evolve from bonobos. We didn't evolve from chimps either. We evolved from a common ancestor. So there was a single common ancestor to all three species before we became the Australopithecus and the Homo line. So I don't think we derived from bonobos. I don't think it's an example of, of a common ancestor. I think it may be an example of a degree of what we call convergent evolution. So that species that have converged on similar behavior in as much as it is similar, rather than because they share a common ancestor that always had that behavior. So I think this is a bit of a problem with their argument, but they do raise important questions about how much we are a pair bonding species. This is my last book. This is Fred Tote's book, and it's called How Sexual Desire Works. And I'll come clean again. Fred Tote is a personal friend of mine. Um, and I do, fortunately, I really like his, his book and I, and I reviewed it. Um, he works at the Open University there, he is at Milton Keynes. Now, one thing that Fred Tote did, up until really this book came out and some of the work he did before that, evolutionary psychologists were very interested in emotional, social, cognitive aspects hadn't really considered motivational theory. And this is Fred's field, motivation, and he's, he's well versed in evolution as well. And he's been developing motivation theory, motivational theory for a long time now. And in particular, the development of something called incentive salience, which he calls the magnetic power of incentives to engage and attract attention and behavior. So, what Totes and some of his colleagues have done is dismantle the old idea 
of motivation theory as being that we're driven by internal factors such as hormones, but rather that learning, especially early learning, early experiences, romantic experiences, watching your parents, all the early learning and hormones modulate the power of the incentive to exert a pull. It's more subtle. And it means basically your early learning experiences, your early experiences and the hormones that kick in in life affect what you're attracted to and the two have to interact. So he's try, again, he's a bit, he's a bit like um, Jerry Barco. He likes to bring in psychology and social psychology and, and development and all these things into it. So it's more subtle, but it allows for us to think of two different things. And this is based also on the sort of neurochemistry of the system. Now, from the 1990s on, people have began to realize that wanting and liking are two different things and they really are modulated by different neurochemicals. So when you want something, it's dopamine driven. I want that, I want that, I want that. When you like something, it's opioids. These are enkephalins and endorphins. So when you actually feel pleasure, it's endorphins and enkephalins. A lot of people think, even some people who should know better, think that dopamine is about pleasure. It's not. It's drive towards that incentive to gain the pleasure. The opioid releases the actual pleasure. These systems today can become out of kilter. And Fred talks again, like Jerry Barker did, about the mismatch hypothesis. So when you think about it, the things that were around in our ancestral past would have led to wanting and liking, and they would have dovetailed nicely. So you eat things when you're hungry and you've hunted them and whatnot and you have sex and you do all the things that, that are good to make you feel good and the wanting and the liking are well put together. But we've got things in the environment today that short circuit the effort and the time it takes to release dopamine and opioids. We've got things like cigarettes and sex can be too easy if, if you know the right route to it now compared to our tribal past. Let's, let's stick with, with nicotine because it's quite an easy one to explain in a sense. When somebody gets into smoking, once they've gotten over the original feeling, of, oh, it's this smoke in my lungs, and the nicotine hit hits them, they go back for more. This is what happens, because it, it stimulates dopamine and it stimulates opioids. So you want it and you like it, and for a while, you want it and you like it, you want it and you like it. When you've been smoking for quite a while, you stop liking it. You just want it, but you don't like it. So you've got the dopamine push to smoke. That's when you become addicted. But you don't like it. And people with addictions will invariably tell you, I want it, I want it, I need it, I want it. I don't necessarily like it, but I need it. Nobody ever seems to say, oh, I really enjoy that cigarette. They don't say that. They say, I need a cigarette. I want a cigarette. I want a cigarette. Go for me, go for me. There's no more opioid. And this really opens the door to things like um, uh, sexual addiction. It's People poo-poo it. How can you be addicted to sex? People like sex. What do you mean addiction? People who are addicted to sex stop liking it, but they want it. They don't get the pleasure so much. It's all dopamine. One other thing I want to say here is that his book also talks about two systems. System one, an evolutionary old one, driven by older parts of the brain, and you're driven by what's physically present. But then there's a more recently evolved add-on, which involves conscious reasoning. And these are the, the neocortex and what happens during learning and development as we develop. So this actually has implications for desire and sexual behavior. The two can be um, in disharmony. You can think of them a little bit like the angel and the devil on either side of your head having a bit of an argument. The, the devil is the old one. I see something, I want it. The second one is think of the long-term consequences where the pros and cons, you'll damage your partner, you'll damage your health, with this sort of thing. And it really is all based around this wanting and liking incentive segment. So where are we now? How long have I been talking for? Oh, it's about right. A uh, little bit longer than I intended, actually. So I'm going to just run through some conclusions, then I'll open it up to questions. Um, so based on sexual sexual theory and parental investment theory and the work that all these people have done, we can predict that there may be differences in reproductive behaviour. And these are due to four main things. Firstly, a man in theory can create as many babies, um, lots of babies in the time a woman can create one. Secondly, women are fertile for a limited number of years, men are fertile until old age. Thirdly, women invest more time and effort than men in the production of offspring, they are obligated investors. These all sound like men have got the advantage, but actually if you come to number four, women do have the last laugh because it's only men that can 
can be cuckolded, and this has affected things like sexual jealousy. Only men can bring up another man's child. From these things, we can, we can reach a couple of conclusions. Um, the first one, as I've emphasized, is that men and women are more similar than different. Where we find differences, I think we can trace them back to sexual selection, not natural selection, on the bits that have been added on about parental investment theory, the EEA and the mismatch hypothesis. These are the things we need to, to understand. There are some cross-cultural universal differences between men and women in the form of sexual desire that have developed. Where we see these differences, they're usually about motivation rather than ability. Because men seek status, we won't see equal numbers in all professions. And I know the movement is to try and do that. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's probably a really nice idea. But I don't think it's necessarily a good idea. For example, um, if you look at Parliament, when a seat comes up, more men apply to stand for it because of the status than women. So you might have 100 men and 20 women. Do you then make sure um, you choose a woman because you haven't had a woman? Maybe you do. I don't know. I'm just I'm just saying we need to understand the cultural, the, the evolution roots of these things. I'm not I'm not saying that's the way it should be. I'm just saying we need to be aware of why more men go for these sort of things. Um, anyway, anyway, I, th those are just some things. Increasingly, studies have considered non-weird samples, but we shouldn't be complacent. We need to go well beyond testing, you know, white middle class students all the time. I, I think that's important. And finally, we're very fortunate in the range and quality of books out there, which have explored a range of angles based broadly around or influenced by evolutionary psychologists. So, so happy reading. I've just got a couple more slides and then I'll throw it open to questions if you have any. Um, this is called the Shameless Book Plug slide. These are my books on the area. There's my book on Darwin from 2015. There's a book with Will Reader on Evolution and Beer from 2016. There's my book with Will Reader and Jerry Barco, multi-author book, Evolution Perspectives on Human Behavior. That came out a year ago, just over a year ago. And then six weeks ago, the fourth full color edition of Evolutionary Psychology came out. So that's you know, this nice picture of Amanda, and as I say, it's in full color. So finally, here's another recent picture of me. As you see, I've, I've, I've kind of recovered and I'm getting fit again. And I said I'd put my email address up again. So there it is. Below that, if you cut and paste that, or you can contact me, uh, you can get directly through to Cambridge University Press. And if you want to buy the book, you can get 20% off. If you don't buy it, that's absolutely fine. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But thank you for listening to me instead of watching the football tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lance. That was as fascinating as I, as I expected it would be. It's um, a most extraordinary subject, and uh, I'm sure it's stirred a lot of thoughts in many people's minds. So uh, if anyone has questions, please uh, put, uh, put it in the chat room and we'll, we'll bring it up. Or okay. if, you, <laughs> if you prefer, um, make yourself visible and uh, wave your hand to attract attention and, and then give your question in person. Um, I, I certainly have uh, many thoughts coming from it. The, 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 the idea of males being larger to, because they have to compete with other males and, and fight to have access to the females. And uh, yet we have the thing that, that in most species, the males are often more beautiful in mm. order to compete mm. for the attention of females. Mm. But in humans, it's the female who's beautiful. So, so what is the female comp competing for? Mm. She's competing for the status, perhaps, or the uh, some quality of the male to have a choice of males. And at the same time, the males are competing. So we have com competition going two ways in humans, whereas not in, in, in other species. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I, th I think it's an important point. And I think it's because we do form enduring pair bonds. Once males start to invest in the offspring, then females start to compete for males. And females do compete for males, not as much as males compete for females. And I think that's why women are sexy. When I say sexy, I don't mean personally subjective, although I do, but put that aside i mean objectively women have secondary sexual characteristics they don't really need to have to keep the male around and, and keep the male 
interested. And if you, as I said, 99% of mammals, the males don't invest in the offspring. Human males are very high in parental investment. It's not as high as females. Once males start to invest in offspring, then females have something to compete for, to compete for that investment. And an actual female-female competition can be quite horrible and can be one of the reasons a lot of women suffer today, actually, contrary to the argument that patriarchal, I accept that as well. But a lot of the problems women have, like anorexia, are often driven by female-female competition for males. I, I, I hope that kind of answers that a bit. Yes, and of course, the, the question of attracting the male to keep the male around and to, to get some, some use from the male beyond the, the simple acquisition of sperm, uh, some birds actually make the male help to build a nest before the female allows mating. And this means that the, the, the male has had quite an investment and therefore uh, it wouldn't be worth his while to, to go stro strolling off. That's an important point, Don. I, I think humans are more like birds than we are like mammals. In fact, A, we, we're bipedal when we walk, and unlike being quadrupedal, but that, that's probably beside the point. But you're right, with songbirds, the males are high investors. They don't produce the eggs, so the females are always higher investors. But the, the males have to invest in them because the, the eggs are born, they're born so immature that they need the male help, otherwise they won't survive. And it's a bit like that with humans because human babies are born quite immature compared to other mammals, even other primates. So, you know, the, the males invest because they need to, to produce surviving offspring and then the females need to test the male. You're right, you know, you're going to build me a good nest sort of thing. So we are a bit like birds, I think. Of course, it's, it's only some birds. The yeah, yeah, some dog, birds. for example, is right at the opposite end, isn't it? Yes, we, we also have the birds, um, the galliforms, which we saw ducks and, and geese and chickens and all those sort of things. But the males, again, they tend to be sexy um, and they give they give their genes and that's about all. The, the female has to help them, but they're born quite mature so they can survive. They don't need parental investment from two parents. So the whole Trevor's parental investment theory, I think, is as important as sexual selection theory in itself. Well, I still don't have any questions coming up. I've got uh, comments let's saying say chat down at the bottom five. I, I, I'm not brilliant with technology, but I think there are five things come up, so I'm not sure if they are questions. Should we, should we click on I, that? I've got comments here. Thank you for a fabulous listening experience. And no question, but thank you. So interesting. Oh, right. Well, that's nice um, anyway. But uh, one other thing that might be interesting to reflect on is that we have uh, evolved, um, both sexes have evolved to to have the maximum number of babies that they transmit into the future. Um, and that's the only force that has created our whole existence. And yet, um, here we are in the modern world where uh, we have an excess of resources, but we certainly don't seem to be following that, uh, that instinct. Although we're following lots of the, of the routines that we evolved with, we don't seem to be following the main strategy that you would think we would. Yeah, I think what we have to do is break it down to, again, the mismatch hypothesis. So people today, both sexes, particularly like sex, and they, they try and get as much as they can by and large, um, and they like good food uh, and all these sorts of things that would have helped our ancestors survive and pass their genes on. But I don't think there's an overall instinct to produce more offspring, I think there are subcomponents because it, I don't think it works on that time scale. It's like I see an attractive, fertile female. I want to be her mate. I want to have sex with her. And that still goes on. But of course, things like contraception have usurped that link between that and producing more surviving offspring. So rather than an overall instinct to produce more kids, I think there are these instincts to have subcomponents that would have led to more kids. And, and, and this whole mismatch thing, I think, it helps to explain a lot. We have to build this, this into it because things like nicotine boost dopamine and, and things that boosted dopamine in the past were things like killing an animal. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't, what do I know? But, but apparently it is exciting and cooking it and eating it and, 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 and having attention from other people, all these things that boost dopamine. There are ways we can, we can um, get it much quicker through things like Cigarettes. I, I keep saying cigarettes. This is an obvious example, but there's lots of other things we can think of. Yes, essentially, we have uh, we have the, the sort of e evolutionary instinct uh, in the form of a toolkit, which 
which achieved these things in, in time mm. gone by. <clears throat> I have a, I, do, I, do I have someone signaling for a question here? Oh, yes. Trevor. Please, yes, please, please, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, very interesting. Unfortunately, I lost 10 minutes because my oh. computer crashed again, but uh, oh. I, I got the idea. Uh, um, I just wondered, you say, I mean, we know that the the, the uh, male, as Donna said, is not as attractive as the as the as the fi uh, as the female in the human species, compared with many other species and things. Mm. You've illustrated that with the peacock, etc. But I wonder, are we seeing some sort of evolutionary change in process now? I mean, over the last I don't know how many years, where there's much more emphasis on men doing things to make themselves more attractive. I'm thinking about uh, perfumes, uh, makeup, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, more exotic clothes perhaps. Is that part of an evolution? Is that just part of a, a, a passing trend you might call this? That's a big question. <laughs> it's not an easy one to answer. <laughs> I, I think I maybe over-egged the bit about males aren't sexy. I, I did it partly as sort of semi-humorous. Uh, it's more important for women to be attractive than men. I don't say that as a moral statement. I'd say it's a statement of fact. It's an empirical statement. But women don't want hideous men. They, they want indications of good genes. And now there are all sorts of ways that your, your genes can be made to look even better. You know, so you can have plastic surgery. You can have, you can have a false suntan. And, and we know that a suntan correlates with fitness and these sort of things or is perceived to do so and, and I think it's, it's probably quite easy to, to do that sort of thing now and there has been I think it's probably not a passing fad but it's something that for most of our revolutionary history you just wouldn't have had time to do all that stuff you know you'd be out hunting and gathering and, and eating and fending off predators and, and whatnot and now we've got a bit more time on hands we can sit down and think about and do more with these things so I think it'll probably continue um, but again, males, you know, females do like males that have got good features. I'm just saying in comparison to other species, we're not very sexy. There's not much that you can say other than a bit of height and upper body strength. Sexual selection has driven that. Most of what we have has been driven by natural selection, I think, except with the sexy brain, which is different. Mm. Thank you. One of the things that uh, one of the books you quoted uh, was saying was was that um, <clears throat> that the pair bonding and um, <clears throat> men taking wives rather than acting like bonobos uh, was something relatively recent. But um, <clears throat> I, I think I don't think I have ever in the last uh, many decades uh, used the Bible to prove a point. Um, but uh, on this occasion, we we have a sample of some writings by people from maybe 4,000 years ago and they do speak of wives and they do speak of um, they do speak of male dominance as well um, so uh, in, in that sense uh, there probably is something to be proved from it. I, yeah I, I certainly think um, the idea that we're not a pair bonding species which sex at dawn suggests uh, makes us think about it to what extent are we or are we possibly a pair bonding species that forms a pair like gibbons and then after a few years moves on there's been, there's been a lot more of that than there used to be but i agree with you that ancient records suggest that we are we have been a pair bonding species for a very long time uh, and indeed fossil and artifact remains suggest that we're a pair bonding species but with a bit of flexibility built into it as the social environment changes so I think they probably by and large got that wrong. And the thing they particularly got wrong was they said, this is quite a recent idea that with this pair bond thing and that we just had sex with everybody else and there was no jealousy. I just don't think that works because jealousy is such a thing. You know, crimes of passion are, are rife. You know, if, if a man kills a woman, it's usually because she's been unfaithful. And sometimes it works the other way, of course. So I, I, I'm sort of largely in agreement with you that I think we are naturally pair bonding, whether or not for life, one can debate perhaps. It's one of our <coughs> interesting characteristics, <coughs> which I don't think happens in, I can't think of an example where it happens in any other animal, is um, that there's a social interference in the mating process. You have um, society approving and disapproving, um, uh, 
and, and enforcing the pair bond, for example, and um, uh, condemning, uh, historically condemning homosexuality. And uh, is this a, an adaptation to, to create more reproduction in the tribe or is it, it would have to be a, a group selection thing if it were? Mm, yeah, I think it would have to be a group selection thing. I mean, I poo-pooed group selection. Um, there's a whole debate these days about the concept of multi-level selection, that whilst the genes are the currency, ultimately, selection can happen at various different levels. So there may be something in that. That's why I said naive group selection, because it's all about the group, forget the individual and the gene. But um, I think the, the other thing is that there is an idea that marriage is is half forced on us by society because it leads to problems and more crime and therefore when you get groups of people um it's best if people make a public commitment and have marriage there's a chap called deacon who promotes this argument i think we've evolved in order to make society more stable and reduce crime and violent crime uh, and he's a kind of group selectionist argument though I, I agree and that there might be some something something in that but that's one idea about why marriage is there it's not just about the pair it's about the rest of the group wanting things to be stable, but also to know where their position is in relation to the pair, that, that sort of thing. So that's how you can bring the group into it. Because it must be true that uh, if a tribe can enforce uh, stable marriage and fathers to support the children uh, rather than wandering off, then, um, then that tribe will reproduce better than, than one where... Uh, people are promiscuous and, and the males don't help to raise the children at all. Yes, yes, that, that's true. I mean, there are there are people who today promote group selectionism, but it's a, it's a more subtle one than the original one that I poo-pooed, you know, and the idea is, yes, if your tribe is more stable and you reproduce at the right levels and people know where they stand, there won't be problems and that tribe will outcompete another tribe. Richard Dawkins would say, of course, yes, but ultimately it's the genes helping to guide that behaviour that is the currency of, of natural sex. So you kind of you can always get around it and bring it back to the genes. But this multi-level selection is quite an interesting. I think there's a whole other talk in, in what level does natural selection act. But ultimately, as part of it, it has to act on the genes and the, the individuals who carry the genes. Yes, it's, of course, that's not mutually contradictory. The mm. Acting on the genes can even have an effect at group selection level, although it's been generally recognised that it's much weaker than individual selection. Yeah, I think I think that's it's generally what people show, and people who know the mathematics of genetics, which isn't my field, tend to to show that yes, right from John Maynard Smith on, really, that um, who was one of my mentors, no longer with us sadly, that the mathematics of the genetics show that individual and gene selection is a much stronger force than group selection, if it exists at all. And it may do under very special circumstances, perhaps for, for certain cases, yeah. Well, this is the, the, the most fascinating subject and I, I could talk about it all night. But, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally astonished that we don't have any questions. I think... Uh, the, what about the chats? But are they just comments? I, I thought of my press... Oh, they're... they're yes. Uh, Oh, we, uh, I've got a, a question from Colin Downey who's just oh, come yeah. in. Uh, do you think sexual selection by language skills will be replaced by psychological <laughs> manipulation and game theory skills? Oh, dear me. <laughs> right. I, I think they're related, really, aren't they? You can't have the other ones without language. This is what uh, Miller would argue. He, he, he claims it all comes back to language. But I mean, it's a very broad thing to say language. And I do think things like psychological manipulations and, and game theory is in there at the same time. So it, 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 he would see it, see it as a subcomponent of language, language skills, the, these sorts of things. And, and you manipulate people psychologically through language and you use language through your, your game theory skills, if you, if you like. It's, it's a bit of an answer that allows both to come into it. <clears throat> well, I, uh, um, I'm quite astonished by the, the small number of questions because this is really a fascinating subject and um, it's I, I, <clears throat> one that I could go on for a long time about. But uh, we're getting up to the witching hour of nine o'clock, so uh, <clears throat> unless, unless there are any more questions, I think we'll probably draw things to a close.
seeing none. Um, oh, yes, by all means, put your picture up again and let's uh, thank uh, Professor Workman for a fantastic evening's talk and um, <coughs> show our appreciation in the usual way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I wish I could be there in person to meet you, and it's, it's such a shame, but but we managed to do it one way or another eventually, and Don and I have been trying for about two years, as I said. So. Yes, the COVID thing is just such a nuisance. Yeah. Um, it would be much nicer to have welcomed you to the institution, but... Uh, and, and have a pint after, it would have been nice. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe maybe we'll do it another time, because maybe, yes. there, there, are, there are lots of things in evolutionary psychology which are of great interest. Well, thank you.